All right, we're in, in Philippians chapter 3, and we started it last week. Uh, my original intent was to go through the whole chapter, and, and I and just couldn't. There's just too much stuff here. So we started chapter 3 last week with the Apostle Paul, and he gave this list of achievements, right? All, all these things that he had accomplished as a human being. Part of it we mentioned happened to him, like he can't help the fact he was born Jewish, but some of them he, he achieved on, on his own. And, and, and you know, he mentioned things like his great family heritage, his... his uh, being uh, rubbing shoulders with the upper echelon of, of society, uh, a Pharisee, which means he had impressive biblical knowledge. All right, he wasn't just you know your typical fisherman out at the Sea of Galilee. He had, he was a studied man when it came to the Word of God. He knew the Word. Uh, he was a commitment level to his faith that, that was just off the charts. I, I mean, he stood out as a man uh, of his faith, and he had this impeccable moral lifestyle. He, he said, "Come on, if you can find anything wrong with me." Let me know. He kind of basically challenged everyone he'd ever known. Come on, bring it. Show me where I've broken the law. Now, uh, he was human. Obviously, he did somewhere. But he, the point was, he, he was just, he just this amazing guy. He's the kind of person we all want to be. He's the kind of person we'd love our children to grow up to be. We're, we're trying to mold and mentor our children to be these types, this type uh, of a person. But he added all of those things up in the first part of chapter 3 of Philippians, and he said, you know what? It, it counted as nothing. It counted as loss. It, it didn't mean anything because he didn't know Jesus yet. So none of it mattered. Uh, he, he would have gone to his grave and it would have been loss. But it would have meant nothing whatsoever. Even all the scripture he knew, all the good things that were part of his life meant absolutely nothing with Jesus, without Jesus Christ. And we talked about last week that, that, uh, the, that just the importance of having, having Jesus in the center of, of our life, if he isn't the center of your world, the center of your relationships, the center of your goals, your dreams, your desires for life, uh, if it doesn't center around Jesus, you're missing something. All the things you do, all the good things you do, the scripture you know, the church attendance, the, 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 the people you're nice to, the homeless you might feed, the, uh, the orphans and the widows you care for, all the things that are very good things to do are nothing without Jesus. That, that Jesus is the thing that makes it all right. That he's the one who, 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 who just, it all, that's when it all adds up to something. But without Jesus, it, it, it's meaningless. And if you're not in a position where, where you're willing literally to lose anything and everything for him, that you look at him as this so valuable that, that nothing in the world compares to him. I'll lose my, my home, my family, my health, my life. I'll give up anything because he's so valuable. If you don't get that, if you're not, that's not how, where you are, then you just don't quite get Jesus yet. You haven't figured out how valuable he is, like the man who, who went into the field and found the treasure and sold everything so he could have that treasure. Jesus said, yeah, that's what the kingdom's like. That, that's what following me is like. When you figure out how valuable he is, then it, everything changes in, in, in your world. So, so that was the first part <laughs> of, of chapter of 3 in Philippians. And in verses 10 and verses 11, Paul said these things like, I, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. I, I, I want to, to share in his sufferings. Not meaning he wants to be nailed to a cross, but he just wants to identify. He wants to be part of, of, of Jesus in his sufferings. And I, he said, I want to become like him in his death and his resurrection. Someday I'm going to heaven. I'll be with him and resurrected. And then he goes on. This is the part we didn't reach in verse 12. And he says, not that I've already attained this. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm still working out my faith with fear and trembling, which we've talked about recently. You know, I'm not there yet. I haven't attained all this. Or am I already perfect? But, but so I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I may have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, he says in verse 17, join in imitating me, Paul speaking, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now uh, tell you even with, with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Like they came to faith and later on they're like, eh, they just, eh, they weren't so interested. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. Their minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. 
And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even to subject all things to himself. I, I, I like verse 15. I mean, I like it all. But verse 15, I kept kind of going back to that as, as I read it through it this week. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And I just kept reading it. What way? I think what way? What are, you, what are you getting to, Paul? How do I know I'm mature? Isn't that, isn't that kind of a challenge in the faith? You know, you might assume, well, I'm a mature Christian. I've been a Christian for 30 years. Go, well, does that make you mature? Uh, there's not a time frame on here. I, 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 think, I think he's telling us something here. What, what does a mature Christian think like? Huh? What, 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 what do they look like? You may be wondering if you're mature in the faith or not. Maybe just maybe you hadn't wondered, and now you are like, wait a minute, am I a mature believer? I don't, I don't, I don't know. What do I classify myself as? Or you may assume you're very mature. This seems to be a pretty good gauge. Some of the things, we'll break this down about how you're doing. How mature are you as a believer in Jesus Christ? Uh, if you consider yourself mature in the faith, here are some ways that Paul says you should be thinking. Think this way. Think this way. Mature thinking moves on from the past. That's the first thing. There's three of them we'll look at. Mature thinking moves on from the past. Four huge, huge words in verse 13. Forgetting what lies behind. Got anything in your past you need to forget and move on from? Uh, we all do. <laughs> we all do. Uh, these these four words, I'm telling you, as I more I thought about it, man, these four words will literally change your life if you let them. If you walk out the door this day, and these are the only four things, four words you remember, this will change your life, potentially. It can give you new direction. It can free you up from, from past mistakes, accidents, Pain. It can pull you out of darkness you might feel like you're in. It will give you freedom to move on when you're stuck. If you're like Paul, Paul looked back at some pretty awesome accomplishments. We, like, we, we studied that more closely last week. But he had some pretty great things. He's like, these are all like home run, awesome attributes about his life. All the stuff we talked about, Hebrew of Hebrews, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, you know, all, all these wonderful things about Paul. It's great. Of course, he counted it as zero, as lost. But here, here's the thing. Don't, don't hang your hat on your accomplishments of the past. If you can look at the past and think, man, I'm glad this, appreciate it, be glad, celebrate it. I did this, I got first place in that, and I, and I accomplished this, and you know, whatever, that, that's great. But don't hang your hat on your past accomplishments because you'll spend all your time living in yesterday just re re reassuring yourself of your awesomeness and not doing anything today. Sometimes you've got to move on, even if you have a great past. <laughs> Every year, people show up to their uh, you know, 10, 15, 20-year reunion, whatever, high school reunions, and they're shocked to see like, some of these really super popular people that, that like, never moved on. <laughs> they're like, what? You know, they, they seemed so cool back then, and now they seem so not cool. <laughs> Why? Because uh, the other people moved on. They, they, they got in their life, they got involved, they got their education, got their job, whatever it is they were doing, and they moved forward, and, and, and some of the people didn't, and they're still stuck in what they did at high school. <laughs> and, and, and they're still living like, like they're in, in high school. And they actually peaked in high school, and 30 years later, they haven't done anything since, right? I mean, I, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying that seems to be the case many times in, in class reunions. See, Paul looks at his stellar past, and he says, yeah, that didn't really mean a whole lot. That didn't, that didn't add up to much. Whatever. He said, it's time to move on, forgetting what lies behind, even when it's good stuff. But there's bad stuff, too. We hang on to some of the bad stuff. Uh, we, 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 we hang on to stuff, mistakes, regrets, disappointments. You could drive through the neighborhoods of any community today, and if you could somehow get into the, the minds of people or hear through the walls of the conversations going on, you would hear the voices of thousands and thousands of people who are living in fear because of a failure in their past of some sort. And they're just living with that. Oh, remember that one time we tried that one thing and it didn't work. And they're just stuck there. 
or they've not moved on from a terrible situation that they were a part of maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and, and, they, and they just they, they can't move on because all they can think about is what happened back then. Or they're buried in the pain of a past divorce. And I realize some of, the, some of that stuff keeps coming back. I mean, sometimes you can't help it. There's children and different things. But, but they're, they're still living in, in that pain. Or they're working unhealthy hours, still trying to impress a father who, who may be not even be alive anymore. Maybe he's been gone 5, 10, 15 years, and you're still trying to get dad's approval. So I'm pouring myself into my job, and their family is, is hurting because of it. Or living in, in just pain, because I, I mentioned a mistake, uh, something they just knew they shouldn't, they regret it, and every day they regret it, and they did it, and, and, and they haven't, haven't moved on. Or afraid to take a risk, because they took a risk once, and it didn't work, so I can't, can't do it again. I mean, the list can go on. We go all day talking about stuff that, 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 that holds people back. Every one of us has something, a sin, a, a, a pain, something. Something I have said has triggered something in your mind, right? We all have something in our past that has potential to keep us down. And the mature believer knows when it's time to move on. It's forgetting what lies behind. It's time to go. It's time to get up and start walking again in the right direction. Now, now, now time means everything, all right? Uh, so, so don't misunderstand me here. There is a time to grieve. There is a time to mourn. There is a time to, to uh, self-evaluate and, 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 and examine and, and, and even feel the pain. Sometimes you've got to just live in the moment of the pain for a while before you can move on. I get that. I get, I, I, I get that. Give yourself that time. But spiritual maturity knows when it's time to move on. It's probably not 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years. It's probably a matter of weeks or months uh, in your situation, whatever it might be. You're probably familiar with the story of Job in the Old Testament. We refer to him periodically, and if you've been around the faith, you've heard his story. But he lost all ten of his children in one day. He lost all of his wealth in one day. This was like the wealthiest man around, everything. His whole life crashed in one day. And all he had left was, was a whiny wife, a boil-ridden body, and, and some friends basically saying, well, if you hadn't been such a lousy person, this wouldn't have happened. You know? And he's sitting there in a pile of ashes, scraping his boils in misery when his wife says, well, just curse God and die. You know, you know I mean, he's not having a good time. This is, this, is, this is a painful time that Job is going through. And, and what he does, as you read through the story of Job, he listens to his friends and he, he has a conversation with God ultimately. He, he sits in his pain for a while. He lets it do its thing. Whatever has to happen, he's just letting, he, he, he's letting it happen. He's grieving. He's... he's, he's feeling tortured. He, he's at the bottom of the pit, right? But there comes a point when he gets up, cleans the dust, the ashes off, and he gets on with his life. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you look at the end of the book of Job, we know uh, his relationship with his wife evidently reignited because he has 10 more children. So at least, I mean, there was something going on, right? Um, he has seven boys, three girls, uh, the women which are considered to be the most beautiful in the land. <laughs> you know, I mean, all these things of great value. His business uh, it, it multiplies. His wealth comes back. He goes on to have an extremely long, extremely successful life after the disaster. Now, that doesn't give him his ten children back. That's not discounting the pain he had. He went through the pain. He sat in the ashes. He let God do what he had to do. He got up, and it was time to move on, and God said, let's get going. Forgetting what lies behind. He didn't forget their names. He didn't forget their children. He didn't forget their faces, their smiles, their laughs. But he moved on and had an amazing, healthy, vibrant, good life for years and years and years afterwards. There are things that happen in our lives, good and bad, Good and bad. That can't be undone. Some you don't want to undo. That can't be redone. Some you wish you could redo. But moving on is a measurement of, of spiritual maturity in, in your life. Uh, so, so sure, Paul brings up some of his past once in a while. Man, I was over here and I got stoned. They tried to kill me. They thought I was dead. This, this, these people ran me out of town. I went over here. You know, he has all these stories that we hear throughout the scripture. He brings those up once in a while because they're part of a story. They're part of what God did in his life. And it helps further the message of Jesus. But he didn't lie around lamenting about it all the time. 
He didn't say, well, you know, I got stoned that one time. I probably shouldn't go tell another's community about Jesus because it doesn't turn out well. No, he got up and he moved on, forgetting what lies behind. He, he went on to the next town, stoned, left for dead, chased out of cities, whatever. He, he, he didn't pine about the good old days, back when I was a Pharisee in good standing, back when everybody loved me. No, he, he did what he did. What happened? He forgot what was behind and as an older man now, he's toward the end of his life, sitting there in a prison, house arrest, saying, forgetting what lies behind, he goes to that next stage, verse 13, the next other area of mature thinking, straining forward to what lies ahead. So he's forgotten what lies behind, now he's straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. The mature-thinking believer in Christ strains forward to the prize. He's a, as Brian mentioned, he's using a racing picture here. Um, that, that, that's, that's what he's referring to. Everybody, everybody there, everybody reading it the first time, everybody in Philippi, Philippi, they knew exactly what he was talking about. It's the athletic illustration where people are running a race and they're getting to the end. And, and look at the posture of this guy who's about to pass the finish line. He is straining forward. He's like, getting here. What, something, I got to get there first. That's all that matters. I got to get there. I got to get there. He's not looking around. He's, he, he's not stopping to talk to the, the dude, three people behind. You know, I'm going to win this race, right? <laughs> he, he's not worried about anything in, in life right there. He is straining forward. And just like today, it's no different. Athletes trained vigorously to, in order to win the race. It was intense. Nobody wants to lose the race. Everybody wants to win. That's just how it is. And, and in those days, the judge sat at the end of the race holding the prize. And that's why Paul says things like, hey, keep your eyes on the prize. You're running this race. Don't forget what you're doing. The judge is there holding the prize. You want the prize, right? Now, now the good thing about Christianity is we all get to win. It's not just the first person to heaven and we're all lost, right? We, like you, you get, he's waiting and he's holding the prize saying, come on, come on. Here, here, here's, here's what you're living your whole life for. He's right there, and then he's at the end. That, that's, that's the picture that Paul is bringing up. And he's looking at the end of the race. And it makes a lot of sense because, like I mentioned, he's toward the end of his life now, and, he, and he's done a lot, and there's a lot that has gone under, a lot of water has gone under the bridge by now. And he says, you know what? I just need to, you all with me, we need to strain forward. We need to strain forward to suit what lies ahead. We need to, to, to press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. That is our mission in life as human beings. I mean, it's to reach others and everything, but I mean, my personal race is I got to get there. I'm going to get there sooner or later. I want to win when I get there. I want to win. I don't want anything to distract me. Nothing to distract me. <coughs> look, look at the guy in the picture. He is focused. You, you can't see the guy cut off any, at, at the top. I don't know if he's like pulled, pulled a muscle or something. He kind of, he's even in the picture kind of looks distracted and he's kind of like, uh, I mean, I'm, he, 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 no, I'm not, he's not lazy. He's not just saying, oh, whatever, I'm not going to win. I think, he's, I think he, something's happened, but has distracted his, his race. Uh, he, he's not looking back at P3. You know, what happens when you look back? Slow down, right? Uh, you, you, can't, you can't keep your intense running and straining forward when you're like, hey, I mean, it just doesn't work. That's why he says, yeah, forget what's behind. He focused. He is completely focused. The, he, he is like one step away from winning. One step. He's right there. Right there. He's not worried about it. He's not thinking, man, those Cheerios were awesome this morning. I'd like to have some more Cheerios. That's not even on his mind right now. Uh, man, that conversation I had before the race started, you know, uh, that guy, he wasn't very nice. He's not thinking about that. <laughs> he's, not, <laughs> he's not thinking about his sore leg. He's not thinking about anything. He's not worried about being comfortable. He's not thinking about the temperature right now. He's not thinking about whether his house payments do or not. He's not worried about anything. Every ounce of his energy is focused on crossing that line first. His eyes are on the price. That is the mature believer's thinking. That is our goal in our thinking. Does that describe your approach to your faith? Only you can answer that. <laughs> How intense are you in pursuing your relationship with Jesus? Is that you? Running towards Jesus with everything you've got. Paul says, yeah. 
mature believers. Think, think like that. Think like that. A mature believer moves on from the past, strains forward to the prize. And the third thing is that uh, imitates godly examples in life. Brothers, he says, join in imitating me. He says, I, hey, I'm not perfect, Paul. Paul's not perfect. Just imitate me as I follow Jesus. Imitate me. Look, look, look around. There's people around you. <laughs> Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Because some people haven't done that, now they've fallen. They, 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 they got distracted from the race. Their eyes aren't on the prize. So, so look around you. Who do you got that you can look at, that you can imitate, and say, I'm going to live like them because they live like Jesus. That, that's a mature thinking. Um, boy, there's no room for ego in our faith. There's no room for, man, I've arrived. I'm smarter than everybody else. I'm, I know the Bible better than anybody else. I'm, I'm further down the road. I, don't, I got nothing to gain from you. We all have something to gain from each other. Something somewhere. We all got something from, that we can gain from. To look for things in, in each other that you can imitate. Paul, Paul wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. There's no one in this room who, who, who stands head and shoulders above the, the other. We're, we're all in this together. And be careful what you imitate in us. Be careful what you imitate in me. I, I could lead you down a path that you don't want to go. See, what we could do, if we're not careful, is we will find all of the vices in life and find a Christian that does that and follow those, and we could be um, running around think, 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 thinking that we can do you know, this delusional spiritual walk, saying that, you know, it's okay to go ahead and lie and cheat and swear and steal and watch all the pornography you want and have adultery and do all these things because I know other Christians who did that, and I'm just following their example. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> He's not, good. He's not saying go to the lowest common denominator. He said go to the highest common. Find the best in everybody. Find the best and follow that. Find the stuff you, you're striving to do and can't do or haven't figured out how to do and you want to do and follow them in, in, in that area. I, I've got some friends who um, love them. Uh, they can't control their tongues. And they don't want to control their tongues. They got to the point they're okay with it. I, I saw this progression over, over the years where the conversation finally turned to, eh, whatever, and then they started letting it go, go freely. And we kind of debate once in a while. And, and, and here's, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to follow them in that because they're wrong. I'll, I, I'll, tell, I'll tell it to their face so, so you know, uh, I'm not talking behind their back. Because um, <laughs> um, we've had the conversation multiple times and they just say I'm wrong. And I say, you know, there's other areas in their life I, I will follow. I still respect them. I still love them. They're still brothers of mine in Christ. Uh, but I'm not going to follow that one. Uh, so be careful what you're watching. Find the strengths. You, you, you know what? You, you want to have a good marriage? Find someone who has a good marriage and, and just kind of say, what, what, man, how, what do you do when, when this happens? Don't, don't just say, how do you have a good marriage? Because they'll be like, I don't know. You know but but have, get some questions. Some, hey, I'm having this struggle in my life. What do you do in that? Because all of our problems are the same. Don't think you're the only ones with certain marital problems, right? Go to someone who's, who's got a great marriage and figure out how they figured that out. You, you want to uh, raise your children to be godly? To find, find someone who has godly adult children and say, hey, how'd you do this? It seems to have worked for you. Because here's what we're struggling with. Now, they might not have the greatest answer, but they, they might say, I, I don't, it just happened, I don't know. But, but they might have something for you. There's, there's something you can learn from them. Uh, you you uh, struggle with finances? Find someone who's good with finances. Uh, and, and, and say, man, I, I, I want to do what's right, and I just do the wrong thing all the time. I'm, I'm just a big dummy. Uh, but you seem to be pretty smart. W what do you do when you want, when this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Be specific and, and, and learn from them. Learn, learn from them. And as you do this, see, you forget what lies behind. You strain forward toward the prize of eternal life in Christ. <laughs> now, as, as you look at your spiritual race, your relationship with, with, with their Christ. Is there anything slowing you down? I mean, is there any reason you shouldn't be the, the, the dude in the front right now? This isn't the comparison to the people around you. This is just your spiritual race. Is there any reason you shouldn't be straining forward just Wanting to finish that cross, cross that finish line. Anything in your spiritual life that weighs you down, and you know it does, get rid of Hebrews. I don't have that verse on the screen, but it's just, just get rid of it. Discard it. <laughs> Anything hindering your relationship, maybe a sin you've allowed to, to keep in or creep in. Maybe there's someone in your life you need to, to forgive, and whatever it is, you're just hanging on to something. 
some bitterness weighing you down to the point you, you just, it just controls your thoughts. You're just driving to work and it just pops in your head. And you're like, just get out of my head. You know, you, you, and it's, it's slowing down your race. There's so many distractions we can have in life. We're all living this life. <laughs> We're all in this race. Uh, the, the, these are the pros, right? I used, I used to coach little, little league when I, you know, my kids were young. And, and, and the, I mean, like the youngest ages, uh, t-ball stuff. Ha- half the job was like getting the outfield just to face the right direction. You know, because they're watching butterflies and, and picking the dandelions. And the, 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 the reason that the fields are so clean, it's not because they do weed stuff. It's because the young kids, they're out there picking the dandelions every, every single day. And, 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 you know, they're not watching the game. They're, you know, they're so distracted. And, and, and we get that way. Relationships distract us. The craziness of schedules of life dis- distract us. Spiritual laziness can, can distract us. Uh, keep running. Don't stop. <laughs> There's just too much at stake. Too much at stake. Don't quit on God. That there comes that time in every race, right? Or even just a workout. If you like to work out, you know what I'm talking about. But in every race, uh, it's been a long time since I've been in a race like that. Uh, but there comes a moment in every time when you're running along, or you're doing your workout, whatever it is, and you're like, I, I don't want to go another step. I'm going to die now. My heart's going to blow out of my my chest, my, I, I, I have nothing left to give. And in your head, you're like, I just want to stop. Every workout has that. Every race has that. And Paul's like, go one more step. This is not the time to stop. Lean in. You, 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 you strain forward. That's every muscle of your body is involved. You go forward. Same thing's true with your spiritual walk. We all have those moments where we just want to float or we just want to stop. It's just tiring. Maybe you feel alone. You feel like nobody cares. You keep, whatever, you keep going. Or life's throwing stuff at you one after another, after another, after another, and you're like, oh, I can't, I just can't do it. Yes, you can. Strain forward. Keep going. Keep running. Jesus is at the end of the race, and he's holding the prize, and his eyes are on you in, in a good way. <laughs> And he's like, come on, <laughs> come on. You keep your eyes on him and finish the race. And let's get the prize. 